CataractCoach.com. We have a great learning case here. Improve your incision, caps rexus, nucleus division, and more. This is a must-see video if you're under training. We have an anonymous resident who's operating. This resident only has about 40 cases under his belt. So caps has been stained with tripan blue dye, getting a good fill of viscoelastic, nice deep fill there. That 19 gauge squirt bottle cannula, that's me instructing the doctor. Here comes a fixation ring, and here comes a keratome, making a temporal phaco incision, not in the clear cornea. I want to start just at the limbal edge so it barely nicks the limbal vessels. So making a little indication there where he's going to start. Starting with the blade here, readjusting. Now this is normal for a resident to take his time or her time and kind of get this done the way you need to to make it right. So there's the incision now. You see that little line that was created, giving him an idea of where to start. Good ton of length, and now entering the AC. Very nice incision. So now time for the capsulorexis. A little more blue dye is being placed in the phaco incision and the side port because that'll stain temporarily the corneal stromus. You can see the tunnel length, and that's very helpful. So here comes the capsulorexis. And now using a cystotome to begin with, even though there's a reasonable red reflex, tripan blue dye is used. And that's something that the residents often do because it makes it easier to visualize. Now, during your training, it's perfectly acceptable to use as much of the tripan blue dye as you need. But once you get into practice, if you don't really need it, you're better off without it. Not just the cost factor, but also eliminating extra steps. So here's creating a nice capsorexis, a good reasonable size. Remember, keeping in mind that size of that pupil and then the size of the capsorexis. You can't always use the pupil as a guide. So nice, generous capsorexis. What seems like too big of a capsorexis, I can tell, is going to be just about perfect. So aiming for about five or five and a half. And I'm instructing the resident to pivot more in the incision. That's it. Get a good pivot so you don't distort the incision. And there's completion, or just about completion, of the rexus. That looks great. Now, hydro dissection is key. So you need to have a lot of fluid waves going here. You need to make sure this nucleus can completely rotate. If it does not spin, you will not win. Trust me on that. So if you're going to do a technique such as divide and conquer or stop and chop, you need that nucleus to spin. Even our chop maneuvers are better off usually with a spinning nucleus. So taking your time, doing enough hydro dissection, tap the center of the nucleus, make sure that fluid wave goes around. And you can see the amount of nuclear density in this lens is pretty good. Maybe it's about three plus nuclear sclerosis. And there you see a good rotation. So once it rotates like this, we know we're in good shape. Now let's see what kind of nucleus division we're gonna do here. So again, that cannula, that 19 gauge cannula pointing things out is me and the resident is the one who's operating. So starting, let's see here, right in the center, looks like a groove. So this will be a central groove and then a cracking technique to achieve the initial um, split of the nucleus into two halves. And so that looks pretty good. I'm helping out by taking away those air bubbles. An experienced surgeon wouldn't mind the air bubbles, you just look past them. But early in the learning curve, sometimes those can be distracting. Now, keeping in mind the central nucleus is deeper and so that has to be sculpted deeper. That was pretty good. And now splitting the nucleus, let's see. It's pretty good. Maybe it needs to be split a little bit more. So let's see what technique's gonna happen now. Hmm, so cleaning up here looks like um, trying to bring a half out. Not sure if that's going to happen. And you can see the resin's having a tough time with that. So what would you do now? What's your next move? You can try again, buzzing in. He's trying to bring out the half, but I don't think the initial crack fully propagated. And I don't know if there are two distinct halves, but that was a successful chop. That went through okay. And there's another chop. Now we're in business here. So this is a stop and chop, initial groove, two halves, not a complete separation of the halves, but it was okay. Given the larger capsorexis, we were able to bring out part of that nucleus. 
and now further sub chopping. Rather, it's doing a pretty good job now keeping the eye in primary, so I like that. This patient was given a retro bulbar block for anesthesia, and you can see there's also great draping of the eyelids and lash margin. No, no eyelashes in the field, I like that. So now taking away the last few bits here of that first half, and then the rest of the nucleus can be fed into the probe pretty easily. It's another advantage here of having a generous capsular excess. If you make a baby-sized four millimeter capsular excess, it's much harder to bring nuclear pieces out of the capsular bag. Now it looks like there's an epinuclear shell that's remaining. And the key here is to use just vacuum to bring it up and using that chopper to push the epinuclear shell forwards. And if you can't get it, that's okay. We can just do it with the IA probe. And so here the resin's gonna switch over to the IA probe and that's gonna offer a lot more control in order to remove the cortex as well as this um, leftover epinucleus. So there we go, port up, going in here. Some nice aspiration. And again, if this is too thick of an epinuclear shell, you can use your second instrument like this and mush the pieces into the smaller IA port. And those go down pretty nicely. Notice how the eye stays in primary here. So this is a pretty good job for only having done about 40 cases, maybe 50 at the most so far. This resin's doing a fine job. So good cleanup here, a little bit of wispy cortex that's left. Now what about capsular bag polishing? Is that something important to do? Well, this is an interesting case. If you look carefully, on the back surface, the posterior surface of the posterior capsule, this patient also had a vitreous hemorrhage, and there's some blood staining of that. So no matter how hard the resident tries to scrub that anterior surface of the posterior capsule, you won't be able to get that out. That's okay. This patient, if you need to, you can always do a YAG capsulotomy in the post-op period. This patient also has a history of proliferative diabetic retinopathy and vitreous hemorrhage. So cleaning up, and there you see that blood stain on the posterior surface of the posterior capsule. Fill in the capsule bag. Notice how it's filled through the side port with the cohesive viscoelastic. And that's because it's less likely to cause uh, release of viscoelastic through the incision. If you do it through the main incision, that cohesive viscoelastic, if you distort the incision, it'll all come right out of the eye. Here's a single piece of acrylic lens, loaded up and gonna be delivered right inside the eye. Little bit of counter traction there. And you're asking yourself, how are there three hands here? Well, the side port, the cannula, is me giving a little bit of an assist because the resident had two hands on that injector. That's the twist style injector. Now this lens can be fully opened up and you see what you thought was a huge rexus is actually perfect. That optic is six millimeters and you can see it's overlapped 360 degrees by the capsular rexus. Therefore that's about a five to five and a half millimeter capsular rexus. So removing viscoelastic from the eye and you can tilt the lens. If you've only done 40, 50 cases, less than a couple hundred, it's okay to just tilt the lens to remove viscoelastic. You don't necessarily have to go behind the optic like you see me do in my videos. That's a little bit of a tougher move to accomplish for a novice surgeon, and you'll get there. Here we go, centering up the lens, and now it's time to seal up the incisions. Watch carefully. Here's the right way to seal up an incision. A little bit of hydration back and forth. Just back and forth, mid-stroma, not near the decimate attachment, and you don't need a huge amount of it. If you're doing these very large white boluses on either side of the incision, that's really not nearly as effective as what I'm showing you. So great case, I hope you learned a lot. Beautiful case for a resident. Keep up the good work and I hope to see you progress even more.